since not go got and well until the time of his death. I actually wrote, I think it was around the 24th of June, I realized I was forgetting certain things and then I was preparing for a testimony. So I start thinking to myself, what happens to the testimony if I actually start forgetting some of the parts of this testimony? I decided to write down everything. Novel happened to, on the 26th of May, he happened to get his second shot of the COVID vaccine. And then, on the 29th of May, we went to Kapeka. He was seemingly okay. On the 30th of May, Nobo went for a family meeting. I wasn't there with him. And I only learned this about um, four or five days ago that at a family meeting, and this was the cousin telling me, he seemed to be sweating weird. There was something about the way he was sweating. And the cousin was wondering about what's up with him. But the only thing that had preceded this was the vaccine. His second shot on the 26th. And then on the 1st, 1st of June, my mom comes in with my brother. And that night when he came home, As a way of greeting, welcome back. How was your day? How are you? And he's like, I'm not feeling well. He's like, what's up? It's like, I think there's something in my throat. Like, your throat? You know, there's COVID going around now. But if it's COVID, we need to get all these medicines that have been recommended to try and treat COVID. That day, since my mom had just come in, and it was the first time he was mentioning anything, they actually greeted. Hug. We were very happy to see each other. And then, it so happens, the following day, he started feeling really weird. When he went to work, it was a day for my cousin's bachelor's party, but he wasn't feeling well. He went to work, came for the bachelor's party, and went to sleep instead. So I get to the venue of the party, and he's sleeping. I ask, what's the problem? It's like I'm feeling feverish. Have you taken any medicine? I'm going to check, but it's after I eat something. I went and got him something to eat, and he took the medication. And after the medication, he actually went out and socialized with everyone. And then on the third, on the third it was the wedding. He took this bunch of pills because on the second he had actually gotten medicine. When I told him what if, what if it's COVID, when he went to work, he got a bunch of medicines. And so he was taking them. They included antibiotics, anti-inflammatories, and those dates and methods on seeing. All these things recommended for, for COVID. On the third, when the, the wedding was happening, my cousins are asking me, is Professor coming? We actually, we couldn't fit in the same car because there was a number of us going for the... He used one car and he used another car. So he was supposed to come for the function in time because they really expected him to give a speech. He took medication before we set off. He's like, let me rest. I won't go for the charge function, but I'll be at the reception. Let me just skip off the effect of the medicines. So at the function, when my cousins are asking about where he is, I'm like, he wasn't feeling well, took some medication and said he was coming. But it's possible the medication is making him feel funny. That's why he's not showing up yet. And immediately I called him kind of understanding why he wouldn't show up. And then when I called him, he's like, you know what? We are almost there. We are very near the venue. I'm like, okay. I communicated with my cousins. And I tell them, he says he's actually near. And when he got to the wedding, anyone
anyone who saw him at the wedding, all these days, anyone who saw him, you wouldn't know there's anything happening to him because he was always doing things like he's normal. So he goes to the function, he's welcomed, time for his speech comes, he gives his speech, he drinks, because he had eaten something at home, he took mostly juice that day, he really drank a lot of juice, and that was the end of the 3rd of June. And then on the 4th of June, he was acting like it's just, you know, something in my throat. Every time I would ask, how are you? How are you feeling? He would be like, I'm okay. And then I would be thinking, okay, since he says he's okay, he's really okay. On the 5th, he's like, he actually said it on the 4th. Tomorrow we have to go shopping. I'm like, it's okay. So we go shopping. He is the one driving. The only weird thing that day was when we were coming back from shopping, he's like, can we turn off this AC? And that was a bit off because he's the one who is never bothered by the AC. It's me who is usually like, it's too cold. I told him it's okay. And that fifth got finished. On the sixth, he got up, he would get up and do things like he's normal. He actually went out and swept the compound. Came back with a bit of sweat. And I'm thinking he's sweating because he swept the compound. On the 7th, when I wake up and I ask the same questions I usually ask, so how are you feeling? He's like, I'm okay. And he was on his phone. I'm okay. He's like, okay. I moved to the sitting room. The moment I sat, a call comes in, and it's my aunt. And she's asking, is Nobo okay? I'm like, what do you mean? Because I just, you know, passed by him, made sure he's okay. Because he told me he was okay when I said, how are you? My aunt is like, how come he's talking about ICU, saying something like, he could end up in ICU. I'm like, what are you talking about? I just got up from the chair. I went to find Nobo where he was seated. There's a spot somewhere in the kitchen. He wasn't there. I proceeded to the bedroom and he was there. I'm like, no, but what is Auntie Judith talking about? I just talked to you, asked how you were, you told me you're okay. And Auntie Judith is actually on the phone listening to all this. I'm like, Auntie Judith is saying something about ICU. Where does ICU come in when you just say you're feeling okay? He's like, I'm sorry. That was again strange. He's like, what is all this is okay? This I see you. She's apologizing for mentioning that to my aunt. And so when he got off the phone, there was actually someone he was talking to. He's like, let me find out from, I don't know which clinic, if they can help with something. When he talked to this person on loudspeaker, person is like, can I get a cylinder of oxygen? That was even more puzzling. Like now, how do we get to this? From okay to ICU to a cylinder? I got so confused. I'm like, you get a cylinder for someone to go home and use. There are no monitors. There are no medical staff. There's nothing. And how come we are talking about a cylinder? I tell these people, can you please get me a pulse oximeter? They say, it's okay, we'll try to get one. They are rare these days. They are a bit expensive. People are using them so much, but let's try. In the evening, they sent me the pulse oximeter at around 4 p.m. A lot of running around was going on. I was trying to get medicine to see if it can help him feel better. I went to some pharmacies. Whatever I got, probably didn't do much. When they got the pulse oximeter, I, I decided to monitor the oxygen saturation. It was between 84 and 89. I was thinking, hopefully it will go from that 89 to 90, which would make me feel much better. A few hours down the road, he doses off. I continue monitoring the oxygen sats. They stay there between 84 and 89. I'm like, okay, let me go to bed and sleep, and then I'll get him his medicine at 4 a.m. 
I set the alarm for 4 a.m. and it went off. I woke up, took his oxygen again. It was 87. I went to the kitchen to pick some water for the medicine. And it didn't even take more than three minutes. It was like two minutes just to get water. And I came back and he seemed breathless. He was like sweating, yet I just left him and he was seemingly comfortable. I'm like, what did you do now? Why are you like this? It's like I went, no, it's me who asked again, did you go to the bathroom? Because I noted in the past few hours. When he goes to the bathroom, he ends up weird. So it's like, yes, I went to the bathroom. I took the pulse, the, the, the oxygen saturation again, and now it was 77. And it was the most scary thing I've seen in my life ever. I just got my phone, checking, disappeared into the bathroom, called hospital. When I called, it is actually the head of ICU who I called. I tell her, you know what, doctor? I have a very sick patient. Do you have space in ICU? Because I was thinking this is very serious. She's like, you know what? How old is this patient? Who is the patient? I'm like, it's my husband. He's 46. What is wrong with him? I'm like, I just took his oxygen saturation and it, it was initially 87. I go to the kitchen to pick water. I come back at 77. Because I came back when he's sweating, having a weird small cough, and kind of breathless. She's like, we need him in hospital already. Let me organize for a bed, we organize for space, and then we actually do what? Bring him in. An ambulance should be picking him very soon. When I came from the bathroom, I told Nobo, I'll call the hospital. They are going to take you now. She's like, no. It was a serious no. And this is what made sense now. I think he was scared of being in hospital. He didn't want me to know that he wasn't feeling well. The ambulance came in about 40 minutes and we actually took him. But that was after he had like really objected and a lot of pleading, a lot of pleading went on. And then he was like, it's okay. The moment they put him in the ambulance and took his oxygen, it was 81 now. We got to the hospital and they started doing all kinds of things on him. I don't even know what to say. It's just that too much has happened. Let me just give different points of a few important things that happened. On that day of admission, a CT was done. CT scan of the chest was done. I've ever seen in my life now. I didn't want to describe it to anyone who hadn't seen it. I don't know what to say about that city. It was the most scary thing. All the lungs were... He was left with a few patches at the apex of each lung. That is all that was left there. And when they put him on oxygen, we realized he could only be stable when it's on high flow oxygen, about 20 liters. They put prongs, they put the mask, and he's on both these things, and that is when he's stable. And it was making sense with the image I saw, or all the images I saw of the CT scan. As the days went on, Novo was it is now that I can say he was scared because I tried to make sense of it for the 11 days he refused to sleep. Everyone pleaded with him to sleep and he refused because he knew that when you have anything to do with COVID and you sleep, he either don't wake up or something. Something just ingrained that in him, he refused to sleep. Now that became a major problem for everyone. And after 11 days of refusing to sleep, he had a respiratory arrest. The team got him, that is on the 17th, intubated immediately. And the good thing is there was someone attending at that time because they never left him at all, alone. 
there was always someone. So one of the ICU nurses is with him, and he just is in collapse. He had just had breakfast. He had just done some things. And then uh, he collapses. The nurse gets him, calls for help. They all come in. Intubation is done. Ventilation is started. That was one near miss, but they, I won't say they revived him, but at least they managed to get him breathing again. And then on the 22nd, a chest X-ray was done, it was showing the right lung, it was a little improved, but it was still bad compared to what it was on the 8th. The left lung was still very bad. They didn't even show me the chest strain. On that day, he had a cardiac arrest. They resuscitated, got him back.